We opened the show yesterday with a discussion about the crisis of masculinity and the rise of Andrew Tate. And to very briefly summarize the key points made in that conversation, boys are growing up in a culture that is openly hostile to masculinity, and many are forced to navigate the minefield without the benefits of strong male role models to show them the path. And this crisis is self-perpetuating. It grows exponentially because the young men with absentee fathers eventually become absentee fathers themselves, repeating the cycle indefinitely unto infinity. And into this field of confusion and man-hatred steps guys like Andrew Tate and others, quickly earning an enormous following of young men who understandably flock to somebody who has a message that embraces masculinity rather than treating it like a disease. Andrew Tate, very often good at identifying the problems in our culture as they pertain to the situation that men face, and deserves credit for speaking up in defense of masculinity rather than denigrating it and calling for its eradication, essentially. But in my view, he misses the mark when it comes to the remedy. He seems to basically understand the disease, but he doesn't have the right prescription for it, or at least the full prescription. Yes, men should reject the programming that our culture wants to subject them to, uh, programming which seeks to neuter and feminize them. Yes, they should work hard. They should take care of their minds and their bodies. Yes, they should strive for success, including financial success. But a life of hedonism and materialism and luxurious wealth remaining unmarried while sleeping with dozens of different women and so on is not the ideal to strive towards. Rather, what men are called to and created for and the only sort of life that will be truly happy, that they'll find true happiness and joy in, is a life of service as protector and provider. Men, the vast majority of men anyway, are called to be husbands and fathers, to be leaders of their families. Now, they may be called to lead in other ways, too, but first they must care for their families. If there's any saving our civilization at this point, which I think there is, but if there is, this is how it will be done, and this is who will do it. It's not going to be saved by influencers who are sitting in front of cameras, whether the guy in front of the camera is Andrew Tate or me or anyone else. It'll be saved through the formation and preservation of strong, intact loving, and well-led families. That is the only way. It is the only way forward. If every man in the country starts going to the gym and starts making lots of money and starts having sex with lots of attractive women, and yet they don't get married and stay married and have children and raise and love those children, then we will still be headed to ruin. It'll be a slightly different kind of ruin, but ruin all the same. Those men themselves will ultimately find the happiness that, uh, that they are able to derive in that lifestyle. They'll find that it's shallow and it's fleeting. And in the end, they'll die alone, loved by no one, loving no one, remembered by no one, leaving no legacy behind. The feminized and neutered and effeminate man that our left-wing culture seeks to create, and then this other sort of man, both unmarried, both childless, will look very similar in the end having taken two very different paths just to arrive together at essentially the same place. It's the family man, the devoted father and husband, whose different path actually leads to a different and much better conclusion. Now, I've, of course, been preaching this message for as long as I've had an audience to preach to, and I have uh, found that there are like two or three basic responses or rebuttals, I guess, that I always hear from young men who who may, for the most part, line up with me ideologically, but who doubt the wisdom of the get married and have kids prescription. And I was uh, greeted with these same responses after the show yesterday and many messages and comments. What I'd like to do today is answer the objections, or at least what seems to be the one principal objection. The claim that I so often hear is that, well, marriage and family life is a trap. It's a scam especially for men. The whole thing is rigged against us. There is nothing for a man to do but give up on the entire enterprise and and go his own way. In fact, there's a whole movement online. Men go their own way. And that's basically the idea. Just give up on this stuff and, and do something else. This argument was summarized in a comment from a listener named Joshua, which I'll read because I think it just is representative of, of this sort of mentality. He says, still sounds like Matt and most tradcons definition of what masculinity means is exclusively through the lens of women and children's wants and needs. 
Unfortunately, that ideal will no longer work in the modern world with birth control, hookup culture, social media, and court systems that favor women and the denigration of traditional masculinity. I don't agree with all of Tate's views, but it sure beats Matt's prescriptions for young men. Again, I've read a great many comments making the same kind of point. A private message from another listener has a similar theme. It says, Matt, I agree with many of your opinions, but your message to men is off base. Young men follow Andrew Tate because his lifestyle is the ideal, whether you admit it or not. Wealth, fame, status, beautiful women were biologically programmed to want those things. Marriage is a losing game. The only solution in modern society is to reject the life of service, as you call it. So what is the problem with uh, this view? Well, to begin with, it's nothing less than a full, unconditional surrender to the culture. It's true that the culture has increasingly made it difficult for both men and women to form and maintain strong, intact lasting families. And that's because the elites who run our society don't want you to live that kind of life. They prefer that you focus on your individual wants, on fulfilling your own needs and, and satisfying your own desires. That's what they prefer for you. That's the life they want for you. A self-focused life is precisely the sort of life they wish for you. Makes you easier to manipulate less of a threat to their agenda. Not really a threat at all. I mean, if you're just out there focused on yourself, um, you know, being a consumer, buying lots of things for yourself, consuming things for yourself, um, you know, uh, and all the rest of it, you're not a threat to, to, to their agenda at all. I mean, you're, you're going along with it. Um, all of the things mentioned by Joshua in his comment, all of those things represent a conspiracy against the family. He's right about that. The way the family court systems are set up, birth control, all the rest of it. It's an attack on the family. So what is the answer? To give up? To give the conspirators exactly what they want? To reward them for their efforts by turning your back on the very thing they've been assaulting for decades? The family is the fortress that they have been attacking. And you can defend it with your life, or you can wave the white flag. But if you choose to surrender, then at least be honest about what you're doing. Be honest. This is not a rejection of the left's agenda, of a cultural elite's agenda. You are, you are submitting to it. It is a submission. It is certainly not the strong or masculine response to run away and abandon your post to stop fighting because the fight is too difficult. I mean, that approach is many things, but it certainly isn't manly. And where do you go instead? I mean, what is the next move? To give up on the family is to give up on human civilization, seeing as how there cannot be a human civilization without the family. So uh, what's plan B after you've given up on civilization? Where, what's next? You're also giving up on yourself, on your own legacy, your own bloodline. You're, you are descended from a long line of men stretching back thousands of years who formed families and raised children, often under circumstances far more dire than what we face. And you're giving up on them too. You're, you're, you, you are surrendering your future and your past. You're giving up on everything. And what is your consolation prize? Finding financial success? I mean, the unfortunate irony is that many of the people that, many of the men who uh, give up on these things in, in favor of, well, I'll just focus on myself and try to be financially successful, many of them are never even going to be financial, financially successful. So they end up with just nothing. They end up broke and alone with nothing. But even if you find it, the financial success, so what? I mean, who cares about money if you have nothing meaningful to spend it on? I have money. I don't have Andrew Tate's money, but I have money. And nearly all the joy and happiness I derive from having money is that it allows me to provide for my family. That's pretty much it. That's the entire thing. That's why I, I like having the money, is that I find great pleasure in being able to care for a wife and six kids. Proud of that fact. If I didn't have them, the money would mean very little to me. I mean, I could buy nice things and drive a fancy car and live in my nice house alone. But for what? 
Now, does that mean that if you start a family that you're guaranteed to live a joyful and fulfilled life? Well, of course not. It's a risk. And yes, the risks are in some ways much greater in modern times. We have all been poisoned by this demonic culture to one extent or another. We are all poisoned. If you marry someone, you are marrying someone who has been poisoned, who has ingested the poison, who has, uh, you know, had taken a drink from the well of modern culture. Everybody has, as have you. And yes, if things go sideways, if you're a man, you marry a woman and, and your wife turns out to be a disloyal vulture, or if you turn out to be a disloyal vulture, or you both do, um, the deck will be stacked against you in court. No, no, there's no question about that. Divorce may ruin your life. And you know, if you give your heart to someone, if you bind yourself to them, not only through the marriage vow, but then also through children you conceive together, then you will have, they will have all they need to rip your guts out and burn your life to the ground. That is absolutely true. That's the risk, okay? But it's a risk worth taking. Every great joy can become a great tragedy if you aren't careful. Or if you have very bad luck. That's true. So is the answer then to forego all joy? To say forget about joy because it might not work out? To embrace a life of loneliness and misery because you're worried that if you aim higher, you'll end up lonely and miserable? You're worried that in the end you'll end up in this state, so instead you say, well, I might as well just live in this state to begin with. doesn't make any sense. So you take the risk, and you mitigate the risk at the same time by being smart about who you marry and by grounding your marriage and, and your family in faith and mutual devotion, and by working hard every day to hold up your own end of the bargain because yeah, there are some men out there who do everything right, and they're and 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 you know they're great men, and they're devoted to their families, and they're intensely loyal, and all of that, and their families fall apart anyway because they accidentally married a soulless, disloyal scumbag. I mean, that does happen, and sometimes it happens in the reverse. But that's not that's not the majority of cases. Most of the time, it takes two to tango, two to get married, two to ruin the marriage. Which means that marriage is not a mere roll of the dice. There's quite a lot you can do to secure your good fortune. That's why I never cared about the statistics. You know, when I get, was getting married and I heard about this, statistically, this is, I'm not a statistic. I'm not just some number on a spreadsheet. And neither is my wife. We're human beings. I, I, I'm not subject to statistics. Not merely subject to them. Because the one thing statistics don't take into account are choices. It's about the choices you make. Whether your marriage works or not, it's about choices that are made in the marriage. If one or both of you make bad choices, your, your, your chances are going to be very poor. If you make good choices, they won't be. It, that's what it is. And yet the risk is always there. So will you live in fear of it? Or will you have the courage? and go forward anyway. One other thing I want to say, you know, I, I, it, and this is important to, to say that it's just not true, okay? It's just not true that a life of obscene luxury and materialism and selfishness and self-service and of, you know, sleeping with many different women and, and, and all of that, it's not true that that is the ideal, which we so often hear these days. That's the ideal. You know, non-monogamy, having many sexual partners, that is, that, that, that's the ideal, they say. That's not true. Much less is it, is it what we are biologically programmed to desire. No, it's what we're culturally programmed to desire. That is the cultural programming. But I know that it's not biological because I'm a biological organism and I don't desire that. I don't want any life but the one I have. I don't want any woman but the one I married. I mean, you could listen to that and say, oh, that's not true. He's just saying it. That's a cope on your part. That's resentment, envy, talking. 
If I could do my life over from the start, I would find my wife again and marry her again. If I lived 100 lives, I'd marry her in all of them. That's what it means to love somebody. And love is the ideal. Because it's not mere biological programming. It is transcendent. And trust me, it's well worth the risk. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.